On day, boy, you're gonna be too big for your dad to do that. He is such a good dad. And it's just really frustrating when I'm trying my hardest to just like stay strong for my son. And when he got out of the Uber, he just seemed really confused. Like he didn't exactly know where he, like we weren't in the place we were supposed to be in his eyes. So um, he just took off walking and our friend was like, no, Brittany, don't worry about it. I'll go get him. And I was like, okay. But when I had talked to him around 403, he said, I'm walking through the woods. I see the help and I'll be there in five minutes. It just it makes no sense. Two months later, Brittany says she's still searching for answers. Like, I'm not giving up. I'm not ever going to stop. That was Brittany Davis, wife of husband and father, Tyler Davis, who unfortunately is missing. We've heard some of the details from her. We're going to get into a lot more. Is there something that we can do to help find him? It's time to turn on the searchlight. Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Thank you so much for joining me here today. On today's episode, we're getting into the case of Tyler Davis, one that many of you asked me to cover, and I can see why. There's a lot of um, a lot of suspicions flying around this case, and we're going to look into the reasons for that. Before we do get into that case, I just want to let you guys know I had a recent appearance on Where Did the Road Go, the podcast. It's my third time being there. Uh, Soraya is a really good host, and we went over all kinds of stuff, the Elisa Gomez case, um, the murdering mother-in-laws that we talked about recently on Crime After Crime, and all kinds of other true crime-related stuff. So if you want to check that out, I'll have a link in the description box below so you can check out my interview on where did the road go and I want to give Soraya a big thank you for always being a wonderful host. All right, so today we're getting into the case of Tyler Davis and I have a little bit of a strange history with this case. Um, it was suggested very strongly about a month ago and I started looking into it and I was struggling with the reactions that I was seeing or, personally, the reactions I was having while I was reviewing some of the information, but also the reactions that I was seeing around all this. And of course, any time where you have a person go missing um, and there is their wife is one of the people that's providing the information and there's another person that's part of that and that person isn't really providing any information publicly, there's just there's a lot of cause for suspicion right off the bat. And when I was originally looking into it, I just did not have the best feeling about this case. And I didn't think that I'd be able to um, represent it properly to you guys. So I took some time away from it. More suggestions kept coming in for it. So I actually put it back on my list, took a look at it again today and decided, I think I know how to do this. Here we are. So um, before I get into this case, just know that I am not going to play human lie detector in particular uh, with things that his wife has said. I will note some inconsistencies that I've noticed, um, but it's interesting because I've seen what's happened in cases like this, and in particular, I think the Madeline McCann case is the, um, the easiest example to point to. You have Kate that is um, heavily, heavily criticized for her reaction, her demeanor, how she presents herself when she's being interviewed about what possibly happened to her daughter. This case certainly falls into that. I don't think Brittany um, is presenting herself in a way where a lot of people will feel sympathetic towards her. And I think that is one of the unfortunate aspects of this case because we really don't know what's going on here. There is a chance, uh, you know, we, we did the Joshua Bentley update earlier today. We've had several updates over the past few weeks about people that have had a little too much to drink, gone walking off on their own, and there are accidental deaths that do happen in some of those cases. Is that one of the potential outcomes in this case? Certainly. Um, do people have a really good reason to be critical of the information that's been presented around this case? I think so, and I think I can highlight to that highlight that to you guys as we go. But let's go ahead and start with the basics of this case. So starting over at NamUs, Tyler James Davis, a white Caucasian male. Uh, date of last contact, February 24th, 2019. Of course, that was Brittany's birthday. Um, 
missing from Columbus, Ohio at the age of 29. He would still be 29 years old uh, as of when I'm recording this. Uh, they've got him listed at five foot nine, about 195 pounds. And for the circumstances of disappearance, this is another one of those that's really thin. Tyler was last seen on February 24th, 2019, around 3 a.m. near the Hilton at Easton Town Center in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, physical description, we have brown hair, brown eyes, not much else. Thankfully, in terms of physical characteristics for distinctive features, we have a very distinctive one, and that is a birthmark that is on his... I don't, it's not just his upper arm, it's it's most of his arm, his chest, and all the way up to his neck. As a matter of fact, in this photo, you can see just a little hint of it there on his right side of his neck. Uh, and it goes basically all the way down, almost the, the right side of, of his body. So very distinctive um, birthmark. Clothing and accessories, we've got a blue-green flannel that he was wearing, a white t-shirt, and blue jeans. For footwear, we have Nike shoes. Um, there was a podcast about this uh, that was done by True Crime Garage. It was actually broken into two parts. And in that, Brittany describes his shoes saying they were really old. They were like the same shoes that he's had since college. And that was, uh, I think, about seven years prior. So um, we don't have a really great description. I don't have a color or you know model, but they are just Nike shoes and they are older. In terms of images here, we don't really get much outside of, I think this might be a driver's license photo. Almost kind of looks, I mean, I've seen some mug shots that look like that, but I've seen driver's license photos that look like that also. Uh, I haven't bumped into, uh, actually, yeah, we can see here, it's saying that it's a, I believe that's a motor vehicle, Bureau of Motor Vehicle photo. Um, I haven't run into anything in terms of him, him having any type of criminal history. I did bump into a Facebook page for him. We can see that he is a very big Packers fan. Um, he's into Drake, Steve Miller Band, Queen, kind of an interesting mix of different types of musicians, Pink Floyd, Jacob William. Uh, for movies, Smokey and the Bandit, Home Alone, A Christmas Story, uh, you know, just seems like a decent normal kind of family man. Uh, one interesting thing I did note about his Facebook profile is his friends are not visible. And because there has been so much suspicion and swirling around this friend that was with his wife and his um, when they went out for this night, I have a feeling someone might have either made that information private or maybe even removed his friends list from Facebook. I'm not exactly sure which way or the other. But According to what his wife's saying, she doesn't have his login information for this account. So I don't know who would have done that necessarily, unless maybe law enforcement would have done that for some reason. I, I can't imagine they would. But uh, outside of that, something else I've noticed that's interesting about his Facebook profile is there are no pictures of his wife uh, anywhere in his profile. And it doesn't look like he's the biggest Facebook user. It looks like back in his college days, there's some videos from back then where they're doing these kind of, um, you know, like MTV jackass type stunts. Um, but there's just not a whole lot in terms of his personal life. A lot of his child, who is uh, named Aaron after uh, the quarterback for the Packers, Aaron Rodgers, um, but nothing in terms of his wife. And similarly, on her Facebook profile, while there is postings now about him being missing, uh, we can see that just a day after he goes missing, she uploads a photo of the two of them. I believe it might be a wedding photo. But prior to that, there's no photos of him on her Facebook profile either. So it's it's hard to tell. I can't really point at that and say, see, see, you know, that means something's wrong. Uh, it's just some people use Facebook this way. Other use other people use Facebook that way. Um, but I did find it interesting that I didn't see any crossover in terms of uh, their relationship popping up kind of on either profile uh, until he goes missing. But what can we learn about the day that he goes missing? Let's jump over to 10tv.com. Tyler Davis, who family and friends said is from the Wilmington area near Cincinnati. Of course, this is taking place in Ohio, uh, was last seen around 3 a.m. on February 24th. Davis is 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighs 170 pounds. Actually, I don't know if I went over the location information back on the name is profile, but he goes missing from an area... Um, 
well, for last known location, they have it as Columbus, Ohio, uh, over at WNewsSJ.com. He and his wife, Brittany Davis, were in Columbus to celebrate her birthday. He went for a walk outside their hotel around 3 a.m., and he didn't return. So let's jump to a map and take a look at this area real quick. And I've kind of um, highlighted several different locations. This is what we know of their night, primarily from the information that was presented on um, True Crime Garage by Brittany herself. So they check into the Hilton Columbus at Easton. And this Easton, it's it's like a shopping center um, that is wrapped around. I think there's some homes here also. They've got like 200 stores, uh, a couple of hotels that are attached to this. So it's a big complex um, that you can go to and there's 70 restaurants. I mean, it's just a, a huge location. You can see there's a, a theater in the middle of it and it looks like that's a 30 screen theater. Um, so it seems like it's almost a destination in itself to just go there and spend some time there. And Brittany describes on True Crime Garage that uh, they don't go out very often, pretty much only a few times a year for special occasions, maybe on his birthday, maybe on her birthday, and then for their anniversary. So this was one of those occasions. It is her birthday when they decide to go here. Um, they take Aaron to stay with some family and they drive approximately 90 minutes from where they live to go here. So they arrive, they check in at the Hilton Columbus at Easton. They have, uh, I think I said Eaton before, it's actually Easton. Um, they have a friend, I believe it's a friend of his that lives close to the area, about 10 minutes away, and he comes out to meet up with them. Brittany says originally there were some friends of hers that were supposed to come out to meet up with them also, but those plans fell through for some reason. So we just have that group of three. They decide to walk through the shopping center. They're kind of checking out what's in there. Uh, they do stop at two different bars in the shopping center. One of them is called uh, Adobe Gillis which I believe uh, they stop at. And I think they it's a, it looks like it's a margarita place or something like that. Uh, and then there's also Bar Louie. So they stop at these two places, have a drink. Um, but from what I can see, the hours at this place, uh, a lot of these stores and these restaurants and stuff seem to close kind of early. And Brittany describes that her and her husband are kind of just late birds by nature. Uh, I believe she said that she works as a... Uh, as a bartender. She kept just referring to him as a manager. According to some posts I've seen on Web Sleuths, I believe he's a manager for a fast food restaurant, possibly. Um, but obviously, they have some pretty um, different hours in terms of when they would be working. So for them to be up at midnight is really not a big deal. It's kind of normal for them. As a matter of fact, their baby's even kind of used to um, being up that late. So uh, Aaron can spend some time with with daddy and actually see him during the work week. So they're out, they're having a good time, they're jumping from these these bars, uh, and they decide to get in an Uber and go to, they call it a gentleman's club, I think, in uh, the podcast, but it's a strip club, and it is called Dollhouse, and it's about a 20-minute drive away, uh, we can see it right up over here, just about six miles, I guess it's showing, uh, the Dollhouse of Columbus Strip Club, right up here. And from what I understand, they're there until, well, here's one of the things that I kind of have my first question about. Um, from what I can see, the dollhouse actually closes at 2 a.m. But from the story she's telling us, they arrive back at the Hilton Columbus uh, at about 3.15. And we know that this is only at most a 20-minute drive. Google right now is showing it at, at 19. So... Um, I don't know. I'm just wondering why the place closes at two and we have them over an hour and 15 minutes later arriving back there when we only have a 20 minute drive. Uh, and of course there's some interesting things that happen in terms of when they arrive back there and him leaving. So let's go ahead and get to the details of those by jumping to another article. Um, oh, before we do, this is a breakout of the search map, and I wanted to show this to you guys so we could kind of see um, what sections they were looking at, and they were kind of sectioning off. The, the, he's he's going to make a phone call at one point where he tells his wife that I'm in the woods, but I can see the hotel and I'm walking back. And that's another point that I'm struggling with in this story. Um, look at this map. 
I, I mean, there's really nothing that I would consider woods around here. We do have a couple of very specific patches of trees, but we're talking there. I mean, that's not even, not even a block's worth of trees there. If you walk out in any direction, you're going to wind up uh, out in the middle again, where you can see where all the buildings are. And you've got a big highway that is cutting it off on the east. Uh, you've got a Costco that's directly north. Of course, to the west is where the Hilton is and the giant shopping center. Um, down below, you've got like a strip mall. You've got office buildings all over this place. So he calls and tells her that I'm in the woods. And you know, in my mind, I'm, I'm looking at this place. Okay, well, what, what can that mean? This is the one that seems to make the most sense, especially with the story she's telling that supposedly he was going for a walk. I think he even phrased it as I'm going to take a walk around the block. Well, looking at where they were staying, if he was looking for a block, uh, he probably would have been pretty close to this area of trees. There is another area we're going to talk about a little bit later where I have some suspicions. Uh, he might have made a mistake about where he was at. And if you do drop south enough, this is probably the most significant area that I can see that uh, someone might consider uh, you know, a forest. And of course, in this area, we do have a water source. Even in the area right across from the Hilton, we've got a couple water sources. But according to what she said on the podcast, um, one of those ponds was searched. They did have dogs out there. The dogs seemed to hit on one of the ponds. Uh, they did sonar and dive searches. They didn't find anything. So a lot of mystery going on here. Let's see if we can get some more detail. Um, but once again, this is just the search map that they used. And I can see the main area that I was um, concerned about, the area directly across from the Hilton, is marked as a search zone on this map. Um, but what's interesting about this map is this is really maybe just about a square mile that they're looking at here. Not a giant uh, area in terms of searches that I've seen previously on cases that we've covered here. Uh, you know, typically I'll hear about like a three mile search zone, something like that. So this is a pretty tight area. And depending on how many people they had out there, I imagine that they could do a reasonably good job of searching this. Um, but unfortunately, nothing has been found yet. So let's try to dive into the details more a bit here, uh, at least from Brittany's perspective about what happened. Over at abc6onyourside.com, his wife, Brittany Davis, 23, is speaking out and pleading for answers. I was super concerned because obviously we're not from the Columbus area at all, she said. That was the first time I was ever in Easton. He actually said, I'm walking through the woods. I can see the Hilton and I'll be right there, Davis told us. He sounded really confused. Now, interestingly, the hosts on True Crime Podcast kind of point out that it seems like media sources keep saying that she is saying that he sounded confused. And apparently from what she told them, uh, he didn't sound confused at all. Now, that's kind of confusing in itself because I'm seeing on separate interviews from separate media sources that we are hearing that he sounded really confused. So... Uh, I, don't, I don't know why that seems to be changing. And just to be completely open with you guys in terms of the social media talk that's around this case, that's one of the things that people are most suspicious about is there seems to be different variations, different versions of the story uh, coming from the same source. Uh, Brittany even tries to address that on the podcast by saying, I don't know what's happening. I'm talking to these different publications. I'm telling them the same thing, but they're publicizing different parts or they're focusing on different parts. And the story seems like it's being told differently from place to place to place which certainly is reasonable. And I can tell you, doing the research that I do, it's pretty frequent that I run into inconsistencies from one version of a story on one news site compared to a version of that same story on another news site. So um, that is certainly a possibility, but let's continue here. She said she kept calling him, but his phone eventually died. That was the last time I talked to him, and it was a little after 4 a.m. She filed a missing persons report with Columbus police the next day. CPD said officers searched the area but didn't find anything. Davis said family and friends have also passed out more than 20, uh, 2,000 sorry, flyers. Um, I'm just realizing there's some other details you guys need about this. So they go to the strip club. 
Um, and at the strip club, there is some type of, I don't want to say an altercation, but there seems to be a little bit of an argument when Brittany goes to the restroom. She comes back out of the restroom and the lights have been flipped on in the club. And she realizes it must be past closing time and they're trying to get us out. She rounds the corner and she sees that her husband and his friend are kind of arguing with a bouncer. And what what I can gather from that is the bouncer was asking them to leave the building. And Tyler was essentially saying, hey, my wife's in the bathroom. I'm going to wait for my wife. He, he basically wasn't going to leave the building without her. That seems to be the extent of their argument. So they leave, they get their Uber. And you know, in times of the in terms of the time discrepancy I was talking about earlier, maybe there's something to that. Who knows how long it takes to get an Uber, you know, in Columbus at 3 a.m. I really have no point of reference for understanding that. But they get an Uber, they take the drive back around 3:15 um, is when they arrive. But on the drive, she says that he completely just passes out. And they've been drinking all night. She's very honest about, you know, they're going from place to place and, you know, they're having shots at this place. And uh, it seemed like he had a pretty good amount to drink. She also says that he was working real hard to be able to take this time off. Um, so there's there's a lot of factors that she thinks contributes to him essentially falling asleep or passing out in the Uber. Now, they drop them off at 3.15 when she wakes him up, apparently he's in some type of mood. And that's another part of this that gets a little fuzzy for me. Uh, the way she describes it is it's just kind of a normal thing for him. He's just a cranky sleeper. And when you wake him up, he's cranky. Um, I'm seeing things talked about um, online where people are thinking, no, there's got to be something else to that. There's got to be some disagreement that happened, some argument that happened. Some people are going as far as thinking, you know, was there something inappropriate going on between Brittany and his friend? And he happened to see that or something bad happened ar around that type of uh, issue. I don't know. We certainly don't have anything to point out where we can say, you know, yeah, something you know, something's clicking with that because we have witnesses that said that they saw this couple fighting with this third guy while they were at the strip club. We got nothing in terms of really supporting that. But we do have a very strange condition here of uh, him falling asleep, supposedly. He's so tired, he falls asleep in the car. But when they get back, all of a sudden, he decides he wants to go for a walk on his own. I, I don't get it. Um, so he goes off to take this walk. She stays near the front of the hotel. His friend actually goes after him. Now, in the version of the story that she told, it's almost as if she's not sure if the friend actually ever catches up to him. At least I didn't get a very clear feeling about that listening to it. Um, and she notices that her phone looks like it's going to die soon. So she has to run up and charge it for a little bit. That's another thing that people are pretty critical about. They're like, what, what is this thing? You run up and you charge your phone for a couple minutes and then you come back down and you're using it again. You know, phones don't charge that fast. So in terms of this time frame of what's happening, as soon as the car drops them off, there's a lot of strangeness. There's a lot where people think, Hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if they can actually talk to that Uber driver? I think that's a really good point. I'd like to know, first of all, was there three people in there? Uh, now, I am seeing some people say that there's footage from the hotel that night, and you can see that all three of them are in the footage. I haven't seen any of this footage for myself. I haven't seen it referenced in any of the media sources I'm looking at. Uh, so first of all, I'd want to confirm, was there three of them in there? There's something about, if, if you do look at this with a bit of a suspicious eye, there's something about there being a story about why he was passed out in the car that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I don't think it's all that abnormal for someone to fall asleep in a car on a, on a drive, especially after a night like that. You've been bar hopping, you went to a strip club, you've been doing a bunch of shots. There's nothing really all that unreasonable to me about that. Um, but Brittany sure goes to very far lengths to explain why he would have fallen asleep in there. And if you are looking at this from the side of there's something strange going on here, uh, I'm wondering if was there possibly some type of drugs involved here? Was it a drug that he knew about, maybe something he took recreationally or even something else, maybe something he didn't know about? And she kind of alludes to that a little bit too, almost like there's a possibility that something was in a drink of his or a drink of hers that he wound up drinking, something along those lines. 
Um, but regardless, they get back. He walks off. His friend goes after him. Eventually, the friend comes back, and she's like, "Where? where is he? And the friend's just telling her, don't worry about him. Don't worry about him. He's coming back. He's coming right back. And by the way, I'm going home. So that's another point of the story that's very strange is why is the friend going home? And another thing that I particularly find strange is why isn't the friend doing some interviews here? She's not the last person to have seen him, supposedly. Uh, this friend went out. I mean, he had to have made contact with him at some point if he came back and he's telling her, oh, yeah, he's fine. He's going to come right back. Don't worry about it. So there is a gap that I'm seeing in the narrative around this story, and that gap firmly sits on this friend. This is someone that's so close to this couple that he comes out with them to go celebrating, doesn't just go to the bars with them to celebrate her birthday. They all go to a strip club together. I would say that's a pretty close friendship that you've got going on there. But all of a sudden, when they come back, the husband isn't back. The wife is worried, standing out in front of this Hilton alone, waiting for him. Uh, she even goes looking for him at some point, walking around at three, four o'clock in the morning, and the friend decides, eh, I'm just going to go home. Very strange to me. Uh, I wouldn't consider that a great friend of mine if it was my wife that was waiting for me somewhere and they decided to just take off, especially when they lived only 10 minutes away. So um, that's that's where I, I get where a lot of the criticism of this case uh, is coming because when I heard the information for myself, I felt some of it too. But do keep in mind, this is a situation that We've seen a lot in missing persons cases in terms of person has a little bit too, too much to drink, decides to go for a walk on their own and doesn't come back home after that. So what goes on after that? Davis said she doesn't know anyone who would want to hurt him and he would never leave his family behind, especially their one-year-old son, Aaron. He's an amazing dad. He's taught our son so much stuff. I have to be strong for my son until Tyler is back because that's what he would want me to do. Now, uh, NBC Dateline does some coverage on this as well, and I'm really happy they do because before this, you're getting a little bit of local coverage. You've got the podcasts, uh, which certainly helpful, but a lot of this is all from Britney's narrative. And quite honestly, even what we get at NBC News is still from Britney's narrative. We don't have a um, kind of what I bring up in these cases all the time, a good investigative reporter, maybe a local reporter that's doing a little more digging, get, trying to really get into this story. We don't really have that here. But let's go ahead and hear some more information from Brittany. Brittany said a close friend who lives in Columbus came by the hotel to hang out with them. A few hours later, around 8.30, the three of them left the hotel to walk around the shopping center. We got some dinner and went out for the evening, Brittany said. We walked around the town center to get the lay of the land because we were going to go shopping the next day and had a couple's massage planned. Brittany told Dateline nothing was out of ordinary that evening. So already, based on what I told you about their evening before, we see that there is a glaring omission in this story. And I don't know if that means that Brittany didn't tell them, which I kind of doubt because she's open about it in other channels. Um, or if NBC just decided, hey, you know, that thing about the strip club, uh, that would put off some of our viewers. Or I, I really have no idea what the decision making is. But in this version, we don't hear about the strip club at all. And um, that led to some questions that I could see in web sleuths where people were like, we don't even know if this strip club thing is real. Well, we have her talking about it on the podcast. So we know that that certainly happened. Uh, when we were getting out of the Uber... Tyler seemed so confused and frustrated. So here's another one where she's saying he was confused. He said he was going to go for a walk. Brittany said she offered to go with him, but her phone was dying. So their friend went with Tyler instead, while Brittany went to the hotel room to charge her phone. She went back outside a couple minutes later, she said, but couldn't find her husband or their friend. So here's that other weird thing. Um, personally, for my phone, if I can't get get it on the charger for at least 10 minutes. It's just pointless. There's no point in even going upstairs. At that point, I would kick my phone into a power saving mode so that it would stretch its own life out. I wouldn't try to get to a charger for only two minutes. I don't even, I, I really don't think that that's going to give you much phone time at all, especially if you know that you're going to be using it specifically for talking, which we do have happen here. 
I was kind of confused like, what's going on, she said. Then Tyler called me around 3.30 a.m. and said he would be right back to the hotel. A few minutes later, the couple's friend returned to the hotel. Tyler was not with him. He said Tyler would be right back too, but I kept trying to call Tyler and he wouldn't answer, Brittany said. Brittany added that their friend had seen Tyler on the walk, but she was unclear why or at what point they had separated. Around 4.10 a.m., about one hour after Tyler had left for the walk, Brittany's phone rang. It was Tyler. He called and said, I see the hotel. I'm walking through the woods. I'll be right there, Brittany said. He sounded so confused. Here we go again. And he is not an outdoorsy person at all. There could be two trees right beside each other, and he would call that woods. Seconds later, Brittany's phone rang again. It was Tyler. I answered it, and there was an open line for about four seconds. Then the phone hung up, Brittany said. I called him back, and his phone was off, and it's been off ever since. So just looking at this story from Brittany's perspective, I am extremely curious why she would not be questioning this friend. She seems to assume that he made contact with Tyler. He's the last person to have made contact with Tyler. He takes off right after that. I can tell you guys, I've looked into enough cases and spoken to enough family members. Sometimes family members will even wonder Uh, if their own family members have something to do with a disappearance or an unsolved murder. It's not a far stretch to look at the conditions Brittany's talking about here and say, you know what, that friend, something isn't right about this, you know? Uh, And what's interesting, if you do look at this from that perspective that something's going on here, we have the friend coming back and then supposedly the phone ringing after that And I believe that's after the friend leaves. We haven't located the phone. So is there some chance the friend could have driven away and maybe it was a pocket dial or maybe they did it on purpose for some reason to lead her to the assumption that Tyler was still alive after that point? For me, there is a lot of focus that I would have on getting information from this friend and trying to understand what that part of the timeline is. It's the most crucial part of the timeline. And what's frustrating is we have Brittany, who's probably the second most crucial piece, but that's all we have. We don't have what really happened in terms of the person that last contacted. So very, very strange. Jumping over to WLWT5, two months later, and Brittany Davis said she's still searching for answers. It just makes no sense, she said. Nothing makes sense to this point. We're two months in. We have no leads, no possible sightings that are credible. Brittany Davis wants people in the community to look at photos of her husband, especially the distinctive birthmark on his right arm. Columbus police will only say they are continuing to investigate. It's not clear if any security cameras captured Tyler Davis walking around that morning. Uh, And that's an important consideration also because at least throughout all the shopping center and the restaurants and all that, there's probably cameras everywhere. So basically if he would have gone walking to the west I'm almost positive he would have been picked up by something. I did drop down to the street level and kind of virtually walk around the area. If he would have gone directly south of that intersection, it looks like there's a lot of buildings are, and there are. There are office buildings, but they're pretty far back from the street. A lot of them have tree-lined streets, so even if they have cameras on those buildings, they're, they're probably not catching a lot of what's going on on the sidewalks or the actual street. Um And then, of course, if you go east into that wooded area, I think the probability of cameras is is practically none. So um, it it is interesting to me that we haven't heard. She did mention one potential sighting that um, investigators reached out to her about that was camera footage, and they were assuming it was Tyler, but it actually turned out to be Tyler's friend walking back. Apparently, him and Tyler are about the same height and weight, Um, so investigators had mistaken Tyler for his friend when his friend was coming back from. See, that's that's another thing that's driving me crazy about this case. Just knowing where his friend had connected with Tyler would give us a whole different way of looking at this case. Did you connect with him in the woods right across from there? Were you, you know, down south of that? Were you three blocks away? Were you five blocks away? That piece of information is critical in this case. Uh, why isn't Brittany trying to get it. I don't know. 
I really didn't get any sense from the podcast that she was even questioning this friend about that level of detail. And the way I'm looking at it, this friend has key information. Maybe not all the answers, but certainly key information that could help with something as important as a search effort. At myfox28columbus.com, we see an article from April 26, 2019, Search Continues. A website and Facebook page have gone up discussing the disappearance, and a group was back out in the area Friday searching for him. Volunteers were out in the rain passing out flyers, trying to keep attention on the missing persons case. Lisa Adams organized the effort. Of course, my hat is off to anyone that's helping in cases like this, so I just wanted to stop for a second and give Lisa a very big thank you for doing this. He didn't just vanish. He's somewhere. Somebody knows something, Adams said. In the early morning hours, Davis told ABC6 that her husband and a friend who joined them for the evening went for a walk. The friend came back. Her husband never did. That sentence just puts it together for me why I think the information from the friend is so important and why I'm questioning why don't we have it. She's working so hard to raise publicity around this case. Let's do it with the best information. That fact, where did he connect with your husband, is a critical, critical piece to all this. So uh, there is a Facebook group. A group. It looks like it's currently it's a closed group. Uh, I thought I did see some comments that they were going to try to open it up, but uh, it's still a closed group as of right now. Regardless, I'll have a link to that in the description box below. And there is a website, bringtylerdavishome.com. Uh, where you can also come and find some more information, find pictures, uh, some of the search efforts that have been going on, even a video update done by Lisa Adams. And uh, at the very, very bottom in really small letters, they have a donate, a donate link uh, that goes to a PayPal account that's going to basically go directly to the search efforts. Now, there is a GoFundMe that is being raised for this as well, but since I can't get into the official Facebook group, I can't really verify if this is legit or not. Um, it's run by someone named Courtney Brooke. I don't see her in any of the articles. It's basically stating that, uh, you know, that Brittany is now the sole provider for this family. And my heart certainly goes out to her in terms of that, but I just don't know if this is connected to her or not. I've seen too many GoFundMes that are completely unrelated to the person I'm actually trying to help. Plus, We've got search efforts that we know are happening from this particular group. Uh, as a matter of fact, on this webpage, you can see that they were organizing a search uh, just a week or two ago, May 13th and 14th. So on behalf of myself, my amazing supporters on PayPal and Patreon, we're going to make a donation to the search for Tyler Davis and help fund uh, hopefully some more efforts there. Maybe it's posters, uh, maybe it's equipment, bottles of water, whatever they need for that search. In the links down below, you'll also find the Facebook page for Brittany Davis. Um, really, I've already told you about what I've noticed there, just not a whole lot of information about her husband until two days after he goes missing and then posts about him missing. Pretty consistent after that. Uh, interestingly, her friends list, also either private or cleared in some way. Um, it just makes you wonder, is there some type of protection going on with this person? And she did talk about this a little bit in the podcast as well, that uh, the friend seemed to be getting a lot of gruff, I guess, from the internet. And I think that would be really easy to settle if you would just do an interview with you know someone like NBC or something like that and get your information out. Uh, I don't know. If I was in Britney's shoes, I don't know, first of all, why I'd be trusting what this person is saying, even if he is a longtime friend. Uh, you still have to wonder because of where he was, because of him supposedly being the last person to make contact. You have to wonder if there's some possibility that he's involved with this. But even outside of that, are you going to go as far as trying to protect this person at all angles? I mean, they edited his name out of the podcast. The friends lists are either um, secured or blocked on Facebook when nothing else is. All their photos are open. All their likes are open. Everything else is open. So is there some type of protection effort going on around the friend here? And if there is, is that kind of suspicious in itself as well? So uh, as I mentioned, in the links below will also be uh, Tyler's Facebook page um, and, of course, links to both episodes of True Crime Garage, Tyler Davis Part 1 and Tyler Davis Part 2. Got a couple of Reddit threads. Um, 
you basically have people that are just wondering about Britney, about the potential that she's involved, uh, criticizing her delivery, uh, the way she seems pretty much emotionally unaffected talking about this within months. And you, you do have to wonder about that. Uh, I've spoken to family members years after their, their loved one has gone missing, and we can't get through the conversation without them breaking down, choking up. Uh, she has a little bit of choking up on the end of the second part of the True Crime Garage thing, but through the whole first interview segment where she's talking about the actual details of that night doesn't really seem to happen. And like I said, I'm not a human lie detector, but I understand why people are being critical. I also understand that people are different and um, there's just no way to know if that if, if that necessarily means that there's some level of involvement or protection or cover up or anything like that going on here. It's not a good enough indicator. We need proof. And we need someone out there that has the information to actually kick that in. Um, that's another thing I've been kind of surprised about now that I think about it. I don't know if I heard any contact information on the podcast. I don't think I've seen any contact information on any of the articles. But of course, you know me, there will be contact information in the description box below. I did see it at NamUs, but when people do missing person stories like this, it's usually pretty normal that you'd say, hey, if you have some information, you know, contact this department. I don't recall seeing any of that in all of these stories. Very, very strange. Anyway, uh, on top of that, Web Sleuth's threads, there are two threads that have been opened on this. Both of them will be down below. Uh, I did find one that, and we have to keep in mind, this is internet rumor territories where we're going the, with this now. And admittedly, we've been kind of doing that a little bit throughout this whole episode. I hope I've done a good job of pointing out to you when we are treading into that. But there is a post that was made here by a user named Missy20201. I'm a personal friend of Tyler's. He's been my manager, Boro Wendy's, for over a year now, and he's very close with us all, more like a father figure than a manager. So here's a story I got from the coworker he hangs out with weekly, who is even closer to him than I am and spends time with his wife as well. His wife, a friend of theirs, and he went to celebrate his wife's birthday. They had drinks and went to a strip club. They headed back to the hotel, and at some point, Tyler and his friend got into an argument. I don't know what about, but it got Tyler mad enough to go off to the woods. He doesn't lose his cool easily. I assume he smoked to cool off. His wife was concerned, so the friend said he'd go after him, but he came back alone and said it'd be fine. She was still worried and said she'd go after him too, although the friend said she was blowing things out of proportion. She did, she did go anyway, but couldn't find him and returned to the hotel to wait, close to 4 a.m. Tyler called and said he'd be there in 10 minutes. In any case, 4.10 came and went and Tyler never showed. I don't know if the friend was still with the wife or if he had already left by then. Either way, I heard the detective was already had already questioned him and do not know what came of that. Hotel cams show him heading to the hotel, but no one, nobody seems clear if he entered the hotel or not. It is possible police are holding information because I can't imagine the hotel cameras don't show the door. Please keep in mind this is secondhand info because I'm not in contact with the wife. Tyler would not run away. No charges have been made to his bank account. His phone has been off. He'd have no car and he didn't even take a jacket. He wasn't a hardcore druggie. It doesn't look good. We're having a hard time keeping up hope at work. So interesting here, we're hearing about a conflict directly between Tyler and his friend. And in terms of someone needing to cool off to go take a walk, I'd certainly believe that many times before I would believe that he's just grumpy when you wake him up and he's so grumpy that he wants to go for a walk instead of go up and crawl into bed. Um, so, but this person was trying to get verified to be a verified insider. They did not for some reason. I don't know what happened in that part of the process. So we really have to take this information once again with a grain of salt. And the hotel cam footage that they're talking about, I believe that that is what Brittany addressed on the podcast and said that that actually turned out to be uh, Tyler's friend, not Tyler. I don't know if Missy realized that when she wrote this or if Missy was trying to point out, did the friend go back into the hotel room? Um which would be very interesting to know. But moving on, um, so I, I kind of debated if I should throw this in or not, but 
we know that a lot of these missing person cases don't have great outcomes. I heard from a private investigator once that a missing persons case is there's an 80% chance that it's actually a uh, unidentified homicide case. So if that's what we're looking at here, if this is in that greater percentage, the 80% of these that turn out to be homicide cases, at least according to that PI friend, um, and if it does turn out to be a homicide, here are some stats from the FBI about relationships that occur within homicides. And this came from the Uniform Crime Reporting Program. So they've got this pie chart here that shows uh, a breakdown of it. And for 44% of these cases, it's unknown if there's a relationship or not. So I think we can remove that chunk because there might be, there might not be. I consider that data not valid for the point I'm trying to make with you guys. For the amount of cases that they do know about, which is just a little bit over half, 30% of the half, so that means about 60% of these cases turn out to be someone that is known and they're calling it an other known. That means an acquaintance, a friend, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a neighbor, an employee, or an employer. 13.8%. So let's say 14%. And since that is only half that we're talking about there, that's more like 25 to 26% turns out to be family. A stranger only looks to be about 20 to maybe 21% of the time in those cases. So considering that if, if something bad happened to Tyler that is criminally related, the odds are strongly in favor that it is someone that knows him. As a matter of fact, the odds are more in favor that it would be his friend versus his actual family member, looking at it purely by the numbers. Is that what we have going on here? I don't know because I also deal with a lot of these missing persons cases. We've had five updates in the past three weeks about people that had uh, terrible accidents, essentially drank too much, um, walked off, wound up in a, a, a body of water somewhere for at least out of that five, I think three certainly fit that condition, possibly four of them certainly fit that condition. So one more time, just another quick look at the map here. There's something when I was walking around doing my virtual walk of this area that I bumped into, and that's this area down here that's called Easton Oval. Um, you can actually use Google Maps to walk through this circle, but I, I wanna show you guys from the top to make some sense out of this. Some of these buildings are approximately the same height as the Hilton. Uh, and what's what's interesting about that is there's not a lot of very tall buildings in this area. I'm seeing typically two to three story structures. It looks like the Hilton is maybe a five or six story structure. Down here, this Huntington Corporate Trust looks like it's also about a five story structure. And it looks kind of similar in terms of the design of the Hilton. What I'm wondering is if his intent was to go for a walk, keeping in mind he has had some drinks and he was intending to walk for a block, I wonder if he came down Steltzer, went in on Easton Oval, and thought that he was going to be able to come right back up to complete the block and that he would be pretty close to where the Hilton is. If he did that, you can see you're going to get turned around in here. And there are paths. You can even see them kind of highlighted in the map here. Um, there are paths directly through what, once again, he would probably consider a wooded area. Um, and looking at it from the ground level, when you're on the street, looking back at this cluster of buildings for the Huntington National Bank, it's pretty similar in terms of the look of the design of the Hilton, uh, at least for me, you know, trying to do this uh, through a computer monitor instead of actually being there, kind of this building back here. So that's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if there's some possibility. Now, this is in the search area. If we look back at the search area map, um, this is the circle right here. It was actually search zone two. So I would like to think that they probably combed that area. It's probably been um, searched. But there's one other important point that Brittany brought up on the podcast, and that is police are saying they did get a ping from him somewhere near Abbott Labs. And that is this building down here. Once again, we got a water source right here as well. Um, so that's another interesting aspect to all of this. What do you guys think? I really don't know where to go with this one. Um, 
I really had to work hard to not just go with the assumption that, you know, um, Brittany's presentation feels odd and there has to be something to that. She has to be involved with this in some way. Uh, I think that there is a possibility of that. I have no idea what the size of that possibility is. Uh, looking at the stats like we've looked at it, probably more of a possibility that this mystery person who we don't know the name of um, seems to be being protected for some reason from media. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really looking hard in that direction. But of course, there's also this possibility that we've got another potential accident situation that is going on with this case. Do you guys think that there's something else to all this that I've missed? Let's talk about that in the comments down below. And please remember, we have contact info down there. If you have information about this case, please use that contact information. Please send it in and let's try to find the truth of what happened. This is a man that has a son and his son doesn't know where his father is. Uh, I want to give a very big thank you to Laura O'Connell, who made a donation via PayPal. Thank you so much, Laura. I really, really appreciate it. And two new patrons, Mar Castro and Galena, both now contributing via Patreon. Thank you both so much. Once again, case cracked, demonetized. I have absolutely no idea why. Of all the shows, Case Cracked is the least graphic. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, but that's how it is nowadays on YouTube. And thankfully, I've got you wonderful people out there trying to help me not worry about that so much. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Please come back for a brand new Brain Scratch on Friday right here on the Lord and Arts channel.